This is really weird. <laughs> I haven't done this in what? Like nine months, 10 months. Um, hi. <laughs> this is really weird. It feels like I'm talking to like an old friend that I haven't seen in like forever. Um, I kind of forgot the feeling of talking to a camera. We have some things to cover today on why I've been gone on YouTube and kind of just been silent recently on a lot of social media. Um, I went to rehab! <laughs> uh, it's not the most, I mean, it, it, it was a big step for me to take, um, because I felt like I was in this shitty, very shitty cycle with drinking that I thought I would never escape. Let me just start off by saying, um, this is very, very, very negative, but this was hands down the worst year of my life, and I'm going to tell you why, because it led to this decision that I made. Basically, if you guys don't know, I'm a musician, and that's my passion, like that's just like my end game here. Um, I literally live to perform, like that's, I just love making people laugh, I love making people dance, like that's my thing. Um, I met a manager, her name was Angelica Cobb. She basically discovered Katy Perry, she's amazing. Um, I fucking love her. Um, I met up with her because she was interested in possibly managing me. Uh, everything was so fucking, exciting for me and I just was like oh holy shit this is what I need like google her she's amazing she said she's done incredible stuff Angelica Cobb so she signed me onto her management firm and we had these huge fucking plans to basically make me a star and um I mean I know I have it in me to become that but I just needed someone with the tools to help me execute it um, so yeah, everything was great. We released a song called Get Me Through the Night. She continued to manage me. Um, everything was great and dandy, but, uh, she got diagnosed with cancer, um, in her tongue, which is so fucking horrifying and so sad. So she had to stop managing me just to take care of herself, which I completely understand. Um, by the end of 2018, she ended up passing away. That was the first time someone so close to me died. It was it was heartbreaking and I've had to be and I've had to deal with it this whole entire fucking year and I don't know how to deal with shit like that. I grew up so fast. I don't fucking have great coping mechanisms obviously because I went to rehab. Um so I just started to like cover it up and I just started to drink and drink and just like go out and push my responsibilities to the back of my head. I, I had, I didn't want to think about it. I did not want to come face to face with my problems. Um, Cause you know, there's no right or wrong way to deal with someone super close to you passing away. So I just, that's just the only thing I wanted to do. So towards April, I was starting to get a lot better. I was getting my life back on track. I was getting back um, to work get ready for Coachella, like all that stuff. Um, I mean, everything was fine. And then in May, my little nephew got hit by a car on his bike and died. So that's two in one year. Um, I, I don't under, sometimes, like I don't understand why the fucking universe wants to do this to people and to test our limits, but it really fucking sucks. Um, he was riding his bike um, in his neighborhood in Orange County, a very safe neighborhood, um, and some fucking woman was just driving way too fast in the neighborhood and he was crossing the street on his bike and she hit him and he died at eight years old. He would have been nine in August. That has been the hardest thing on me and my entire fucking family 
to go to a funeral for an eight-year-old and watch him be buried into the ground with his favorite toys is just so fucked to see. And for me to, because I'm still dealing with the other death from earlier in the year and now I'm like carrying two on my back and I am just ready to fucking explode, man. So from May all the way up to recently, it's just been hiding. I've just been hiding from people, from work, from my problems, from my friends, from even my fucking own family, hiding from myself. Uh, so the only way I could I don't know if it was I was drinking this much because I wanted to feel something or to not feel something because I'd find myself crying but then I'd find myself laughing and it really fucked with my brain chemistry and I'm keep in mind I'm on antidepressants I'm on anti-anxiety I'm on like other shit for my anxiety disorder and my dissociative disorder so I mean all of these chemicals are fucking fighting with each other and it became so fucked up here. It, it became this war of leaving the house with, I couldn't leave the house without a drink, a shot, a glass of wine. Keep in mind, sometimes this would be at 10 a.m., sometimes this would be at 4 p.m. Um, not the healthiest thing, but when you're doing something for so long or you're trying to hide from something for so long, it just becomes a routine because I think it's like, what? 21 days to start a habit. So if something is happening for over if something is happening like that for over 21 days Your body's just gonna get used to it and think like okay. Here's my morning routine like um, Within the hour of waking up like all right Here's the shot like it's not you don't even realize that it's wrong um, Until like your family and your friends start noticing um, All I wanted to do was sleep and drink that's it um, I used to drink socially and have fun and go out with my friends and just wake up the next day and be like, holy shit, like last night was fucking nuts, man. That part of drinking disappeared. It, it became a coping mechanism. Um, I wasn't avidly going to therapy. I wasn't taking my medication because I'd forget because I was too fucked up. And keep in mind, um, I live alone, so... When you're living alone, you are just, you're caught in your thoughts and you, you don't have a, a third party person to tell you like what is right and what is wrong. It's just your brain and what you're like, you're just stuck in this, in this hole by yourself and it's really, it's really fucking dark. I am not gonna cry in this video. Um, no, I have to be strong for this video. I don't wanna call this a lifelong addiction. I think I was just caught in a very shitty cycle and a very shitty routine. That became a problem and I, it, it was affecting my health and, and my brain. Like, it, it just, day by day, things just kinda started getting worse. And I just, because the amount I was drinking, I knew it was wrong, but I, I, I couldn't stop because I wanted to escape these thoughts that I had. Um, I just wanted to feel loose and happy and, and just like kind of forget about everything for a second. But you, I mean, everyone knows that, you know, the next morning, it, everything comes back at you 10 times harder. Um, and that's when you drink again, and it, that's where the cycle started. Um, so I made the conscious decision uh, after I found myself sleeping for 15 to 17 hours and woke up like, and it was like night out and I didn't know like what the time was or like where I was. Everything was just so fucking blurry and scrambled and wanted everything to just stop. It, I did, it was, I wasn't, suicidal but i just wanted to disappear i just wanted to feel good again and i know if i kept doing this 
that shit would just keep getting worse. So I made the conscious decision to go to a detox rehab. It was very difficult. I walk in, I walked in hammered because I was too afraid to go in sober. I brought in a suitcase of three of Tana's sweatpants and three of Tana's hoodies. And like that is not enough, <laughs> that is not enough clothes for a rehab, sir. But I was just too fucked up. I just wanted to go, I wanted to get better. Um, so I left from Tana's house, Amari drove me um, to the rehab and I walked in. They walked me in, I went straight to this like med room where they like did like psych evaluations on me. I had to like Skype this doctor for 30 minutes to make sure I wasn't going insane, which I feels like you're going insane when you're going through something like this, but apparently I wasn't. <laughs> Yeah, and then they made me strip down basically naked. I was naked in front of them because they had to search all my clothes, made sure I didn't have any drugs or alcohol on me. I wasn't addicted, I'm not addicted to drugs or anything, uh, but they just wanted to make sure that I didn't sneak anything in. Um, they took my phone, they took my camera, they took my laptop. Uh, basically they took it sounds fucked up to say, but they took my life, my life away. Like technology is my life. Like me right now, I'm talking to you. You're probably watching this on your phone or your laptop. Like this is all I know. I started YouTube in like 2008 and that's been my childhood and social media has been my childhood. Like I always want to see what you guys are up to. I want to see, I want to always check in on you. I want you to check in on me. Like it's, this is just like, it's crazy. And I've had this anxiety like this, Phone, my phone is like my safety blanket and like I can't go anywhere without it. But if one thing that detox rehab taught me is um, that I can live in the moment and not need technology to live. All I was allowed to do was watch TV on their TV. Um, all they had was Netflix and Shameless is on Netflix so shout out to Shameless for getting me through rehab, woo! The first three days were very, very difficult. Um, they medically detoxed me, they gave me medicine because if you're like drinking a lot for a long period of time, you can actually like have crazy withdrawals and like actually have a seizure and die. Um, so that's not good, I'm glad I got medically detoxed. They weaned me off using some fun medicines. <laughs> it was me and three other girls there. It, it was this house and we were basically all trapped in there. We're not allowed to leave. We're not allowed to go outside. We can't go on walks. Can't use our phones. All there was was like board games, TV and food. And I'm there for like a hot second. But uh, if any of those girls are watching, if you guys are out, <laughs> hi, I miss you so much. Um, you guys are awesome and you made um, it so much easier for me in there. If I was there alone, I'd fucking go insane. So thank you guys for being my friend and accepting me for who I am. Uh, you know, they knew nothing about me either. So it felt really good to just meet people authentically and connect with them uh, on such a personal and vulnerable level. I was only allowed to have like a visitor every few days. So my brother came to visit me and my dad came to visit me. Here's a pic. Um, my best friend Makoa visited me. I don't have a pic of that, but um, yeah, so basically the consensus is that I cannot deal with problems, like deep problems uh, alone. So when I got out, I was telling my best friend Makoa, I was like, yo, I have an extra room in my apartment. Please move in. Uh, so he lives with me now. <laughs> and uh, I am two weeks, no drinking, and I'm out of the cycle. I'm so fucking happy about it. I, when you're in that cycle, you don't realize that there actually is a light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, I, I really thought it would never fucking end, dude. Never. Thought it would never fucking end. It was just, it was miserable, uh, I mean, being trapped in that house, but like, when you're sober and you have those thoughts, you can really think and work through them. Um, but yeah, I made the decision to go just because it was affecting my work and my relationships and I had money problems. I mean, 
I wasn't working and I'm struggling to pay rent and that's just like It's so fucking weird to say to you guys because like everyone's always just like oh my god I'm a youtuber. I have millions of followers like I'm rich like not everyone a number on YouTube or Instagram is not equal to your bank account like people can fake it all they want um, so I mean don't believe everything you see on social media is basically what I'm saying here like I've struggled I'm struggling like I'm getting back on my feet now um, yeah I'm getting back on my feet now I'm gonna be completely transparent with you right now I'm not saying I'm never gonna drink again which sounds so fucked up because I'm so early in this but like I want to go back to the fun social way I used to be. I'm not saying it's going to happen anytime soon. Um, I just want to be a normal 21 year old and I'm working on that. I'm going to therapy two, three times a week. My therapist is fucking incredible. I'm taking my medicine normally. Like everything is slowly starting to like the puzzle pieces are slowly starting to get put back together. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. And um, I just wanted to say I'm sorry for worrying any of you, I'm sorry for worrying any of my friends if you're watching this and for my family, uh, I'm sorry if this whole situation worried you. I made it through and I'm not, uh, I'm alive. And I'm writing incredible music about this year and this entire situation debacle that I've been through. Um, yeah, so I wrote this song called Crisis, and it's basically like about how this year for me was just a fucking crisis. Uh, and how I couldn't put the bottle down because I wanted to escape everything and disappear. I'm gonna be releasing that within the next uh, couple of weeks. Here's a little teaser if you want to hear some of it. Drinking, tired of the thinking, tired of everybody looking at me like a freak show. Oh, you get me like oh, oh, oh. It is a banger. I'm not gonna lie. Um, <laughs> it's one. It's my favorite song I've ever written. All my friends love it. I'm so fucking ecstatic for you guys to hear it. Thank you for watching. This is my comeback video, I guess. I'm so bored in Hollywood, there's nothing to do now but work. So um, expect more from me. Um, follow me on all my social medias and uh, I'll be announcing the release date for my song Crisis very, 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 very soon. I love you all. Um, hope you took something from this. Um, and uh, I love you so, so much. Thank you.